Well, good morning, Bayou Church, and welcome this morning. Whether you're here this morning with us, or you're online, or in the theater, I invite you to sing praise. Let's praise His name. Here we go. I have seen your faithfulness. You never break your promises. You are good, always good, my Jesus. Am 
course through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean Cause I need you now to do the same church to sing this. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, and I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness.
just saying we have a God of ages the same God the God of the past is faithful the God of the present faithful the God in the future faithful and as we've been singing as we've been worshiping you know we're, we're just we're just joining in to continuous worship that's actually going on in heaven right now we're just joining in in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter four, John tells us, he gives us a glimpse of the throne room with God. And, and he says, and he writes this down, he says, all creatures, all angels, day and night, sing or they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And furthermore, he says that the elders lay down their crowns and they say, worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory, honor, and power. And so as we stand here today, as, as they're doing right now in heaven, we declare Worthy are you, Lord, our God, to receive all of the honor, all of the glory, all the power, all of the praise. Amen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this amazing time that we get to spend together worshiping your name, the name of Jesus, the God of ages who is faithful, who is good, who loves his children as we're gathered together we just sing praises to you and give you all of the honor and the glory for sending your son, Jesus, to us so that we would be free of sin and we would be right with you, Father, that one day we will be with you for eternity. Father, I cannot wait to see what you have in store for us today. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and I pray this in his awesome name. And all who believe said, amen. Amen. You guys and gals, please be seated. Well, good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. In case you don't know me, my name is Ed Gore, and I get the, the honor to, uh, to be the worship pastor here at the church. And I just want to welcome you here this morning. Also, let me also welcome those that are online, uh, in the theater, in the family room. Just want to welcome you guys and gals in as well. And if you're a first time guest and this is your first time here, welcome to the Bayou Church. And if you've been kind of checking us out a little bit, uh, it is your first time and you wanna get to know us more, you can do that in a couple of ways. One is 24 seven online at thebayouchurch.org slash connect. Or if you're here in person, you can uh, fill a card out that's in the, the back seat or on the front back seat where there's a card, you can fill that guy out and uh, drop those in the drop boxes on your way out. And if you're here in person, we'd love to meet you at our guest center. And for first time guests, we have a, a gift for you. And look, when you fill those things out, we're just gonna send you an email. We're, we're not gonna spam your email box or, or, or go to your house. We're just gonna kind of give you a, a, a next step for you to kind of get connected with us. Okay, well, that's all I got. So this morning, We've got a baptism, so let's go ahead and celebrate that. This is a moment when people get to put an outward display to an inward commitment of what God has done in their life. So they're here today to let you know that they no longer live for themselves, but they now live for Jesus Christ.
you, church family. My name is Harley, and I have the awesome job of getting to work with students as our student ministry coordinator here. And today, I am with one of my really good friends, Ella. Um, I love Ella so, so much. I've known her for a long time. Um, back when I was working in kids ministry, I got to see her all the way from kindergarten. And now that I'm in student ministry, she's there too. So I have gotten to see her grow, um, learn about the Lord, and then even put her faith in the Lord, which has been super awesome to see that growth. Um, and I know that it's, it's a decision that she's made, going from having a knowledge of God to then realizing, hey, I want him to actually really impact my life. It's something that's been amazing to see. I know not only for myself, but also for all of her amazing friends and family here today. Um, so Ella, I just have a question for you. Is it true that you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Awesome. It is on that public profession of faith that I get to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Awesome. I'm gonna go ahead and pray for us. Dear God, I just wanna lift up Ella and her family and friends to you right now. Um, it's such an amazing day to just get to celebrate her, celebrate this decision that she's made. And I know that you have already done so much work in her life and in her heart. And I pray that you can continue to do that and just help her grow into the woman that you want her to be. Um, just help guide her life and just help her to shine brightly as she always does. It's in your name we pray, amen. Hi, I'm Justin, and before we hear from our pastor today, I wanna to share what's coming up for you and your family. We'd love to meet you personally and to introduce you to the heartbeat of our church. Our First Steps class is designed to share our history, our vision, and purpose while helping you discover your spiritual gifts and the many ways to get connected. So today, we're on step two, where you can learn about the DNA of the Bayou Church, and we meet at 9.30 a.m., and we'd love to see you there. If you'd like more information, head over to our website at thebayouchurch.org slash first steps. We believe that summer provides the best opportunities for meaningful experiences that help all ages grow in their faith. That's why we offer four fun-filled camps founded on sharing God's truth for each age group. Our next-gen team is ready to help your children grow spiritually and experience God's love this summer. Camp registrations are officially open and space is limited. So if you'd like more information and how to register, simply go to our website, thebayouchurch.org slash summer. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We believe that God has something so special and unique that he wants to say to you today. And our hope is that you feel encouraged for the week ahead. Well, good morning, Bayou Church. Y'all doing all right? Good. Well, hey, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Griff. I'm the student pastor here at the Bayou Church and excited to be with y'all uh, this morning. Last week, we kicked off a series called Out of the Cave. Uh, pastor Sean kicked off what really is becoming a series where we uh, talk about mental health. Uh, Out of the Cave is based on, the least of phrases, based on uh, Chris Hodges' book, Out of the Cave, and also the story of Elijah. And where we're headed is really, we want to talk about some of the things that many people in the culture are struggling with. And specifically this morning, I, I want to talk about something that's very relatable, but also something that's very um, hard for me to not only talk about, but preach on. And really, it's, it's this word, it's anxiety. And anxiety is one of those things where a lot of people struggle with it. A lot of people, whether it's anxiety disorder, whether it's just common anxiety, general anxiety, no matter what it is, um, if you looked at any kind of statistic, anxiety is always in the lead. And if I can give y'all just a few stats, first of all, the, um, the, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America notes that 40 million people struggle with anxiety disorder. This is 19% of the nation's population, 18 years and up, 40 million but then the number increases when it's between the age of 13 and 18. 36% of ages 13 to 18 struggle with an anxiety disorder. And as somebody who's, I'm 34, I've been in student ministry almost 15 years, and as somebody who works with teenagers, um, y'all, like, it is epidemic. Like, it is heightened. Like, literally, mental health disorders are through the roof. And even if you're like, well, we just came out of a pandemic, and even though the pandemic was rough for a lot of people, the pandemic merely exposed what was already taking place in the hearts and souls of a lot of us, but especially teenagers. But also, I want to show you this I wanna show you this statistic, 81.3%. So we sent a survey out to many of you in the church and about 800 uh, really kind of did the survey and there was about eight or nine uh, things that we asked. Hey, what have you struggled with in the last 12 months? 81.3% here at the church said they struggled with anxiety in the last 12 months. 
And if you were to look at the graph, anxiety is actually in the lead of all the things that we asked. It's a, it's a, it's a big topic. It's a big struggle. I know for me, so when I was um, four years old, uh, my parents uh, d- decided to get a divorce. And over time, um, I, I, you know, when you're four, you have no idea what's going on. You legitimately just think your parents are taking a break, they're gonna live somewhere else and all that kind of stuff. You have no idea what's going on, but then as the years go, you, you start to realize, oh wait, my parents are not gonna be together again. When I was eight years old, I went and lived with my mom and my stepdad in Texas because he was in State Farms and he transitioned over to Texas. And y'all, for those five years, I can't tell you how hard it was as an eight-year-old to struggle with every time I left my mom to go see my dad or every time I left my dad to go see my mom, struggling with worth and struggling with, if I leave this one, will they hate me? If I leave that one, will they hate me? And, and being a gone from one of your parents for almost one, like for a whole month and only seeing one of them once a month, it was hard. Over the years... Over the years, as I got into schooling, and over the years, I would become just a horrible sleeper, like literally always struggling with insomnia and never knowing why. And now having twins, I'm back to that cycle. But anyway, <laughs> but bottom line is, man, I would, I would notice that when, as I was getting older, as I became a middle schooler, by the way, you don't graduate middle school, you survive middle school. So my middle school years were rough. And then I get into high school and I still struggled with um, anticipating what people were saying about me. And I would struggle all the time uh, with perception. And I would wonder, man, do people like me? I, I was a, when I was a teenager, I had no game when it comes to uh, 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 hanging out with girls and all that kind of stuff. I was a very confident yet insecure person. And I kept wondering, why do I feel this persistent sadness or why do I feel like I'm always in my head and why do I always feel like I'm always dividing my focus and then as I got to college I realized as a follower of Jesus that I wanted to be strong. I wanted people to see me as the strength. I wanted people to see me as the leader. And so basically I would always talk about strength in Jesus and how hey we're not promised tomorrow live it up today. And I remember my sophomore year in high school, st- college, still struggling with anxiety. I remember I was leading a Bible study I started that, that really blew up. And I had the, this girl came up to me after one of my Bible studies. And she said, Griff, can I tell you something? I said, yeah, absolutely. She goes, your insecurity is leaking. First of all, weird terminology. Second of all, what do you mean? And she's like, Griff, I know that you come across as this super confident guy and you want to lead people to Jesus and you want to be strength for people, but I but I want you to know, like, it is very obvious you care what people think. I want you to know it's very obvious that there are things going on in your world that you're holding back and you're not being honest with and your influence is gonna be limited. Unless you're honest about those things, you're never gonna heal. That hurt. And she was right. Like, I realized that, wow, I have been this guy that's always felt like I had to have it together. I have been this guy that's always felt like, as a Christian, I wanna let you know, I love America, but we have set up churches to be really these perfect, professional, presentable people. We can't struggle. We've gotta be, we've gotta be stoic, and we gotta be strength for people. And I'm like, man, I've never read anywhere in the Bible outside of the Pharisees of people who actually believe they're supposed to do that. And I thought I had to be that even when I got into student ministry as a 19-year-old, I was like, I've got, to be, I've got to be presentable. I've got to be perfect. I've got to be righteous and holy. And I'm not saying those are bad things, but one of the things that lost me was influence with people because I was hiding the fact that I was battling with anxiety. I remember in 2022, or 2012, uh, I had been dating uh, this girl, and over time in the relationship, I noticed that my anxiety was pushing her away. I was becoming controlling. I was worried that me being away and she being there, that maybe she was talking to other guys, and all of a sudden, I'm just freaking out of my mind. And not long after she broke up with me in 2013, I went and saw my mom uh, in Bay St. Louis where she was living at the time, and we decided, hey, let's go see a, a comedy. Let's go hang out and all that kind of stuff. And I remember that when we were coming back from the movie theater, we were driving down uh, one of the roads that uh, had a beautiful view of the beach, and all of a sudden, I'm driving in my car, and my body starts shaking, my heart starts pounding. I literally start to see these black spots. I start, everything just starts shutting down. I said, Mom, you might have to take the wheel. I think I'm dying. I have no idea what's going on in me right now. And I'm freaking out and freaking out. I pull over. I get out of the car. I'm still shaking. I lay on the concrete. I'm still shaking. I'm still freaking out. And after about 30 minutes, my mom is actually teaching me breathing exercises. I start to breathe. I start to come to. And all of a sudden, I said, Mom, what in the world was that? I never want to experience that again. You literally feel like you're suffocating. 
and there's no way out. She goes, you just had your first panic attack. Panic attack? What does that even mean? I've never even heard of that term. Because back then, I act, like I'm, I act like I'm so old. It was only like 12 years ago. <laughs> but, but then, nobody was talking about it, y'all. Nobody was talking about anxiety and panic attacks. It was just like, hey, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and just move on and get over it and be joyful. And I, I had no idea that I even struggled with that. Fast forward, I go to the doctor. I said, doc, what's wrong with me? Like my, my body's panicking. My mom says a panic attack. And he's like, well, what else is going on? Well, I'm eating right. I'm exercising all the things. Well, what's going on? Well, all, besides the fact that I was just broken up with and I'm also trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with my life. And I'm also trying to figure out what student ministry I'm gonna go into. And then I also gotta, he's like, oh, oh, oh I get it. You just need to calm down. And I was diagnosed with anxiety and I was also given prescription pills to take once a day. Just a year and four months, a year and three months ago, two months into my twin's birth, I literally had to switch to something else because what I was on at the current time was not helping. I could not control my emotions. I had a friend walk into my office and say, you need to get help. And I know that a lot of us in this room right now, there's some of us in this room that you have felt like you've had to be tough for too long because, but here's the reality. None of us fake having anxiety and depression. Nobody. You know what we fake? What we fake is being okay. What we fake is putting it all together and acting like that once I show up on Sundays or once I'm in group, I cannot struggle. But some of you right now are suppressing the fact that you might struggle with this and you're wondering, oh, wait, it's not just me? It's not? No, no, it's not. It's not just you. If you have anxiety, you're not crazy. If you, if you struggle with mental health, and hey, I didn't, hey, from all, for even, even in my skeptics of mental health in the room, I didn't ask for a panic attack. I didn't say, hey, I wish I would just feel like I'm dying right now. Like, that didn't happen. I hate it. I asked God to take it away from me every single day. Just yesterday, I was speaking out of town at a Disciple Now event, speaking a few times, and I'm driving to the church that morning. I, I recall a picture of one of my boys. For, for whatever reason, one of my boys has this picture that triggers emotion in me, and I'm just having fun. Can't wait to go preach. I remember this picture. I'm like, oh, God, I'm just, what's wrong with me? Like, I just start sobbing, and, I start, and then I have a panic attack. What? And I miss them, and I'm like, good Lord, I'm just, what is wrong with me? I keep telling myself, ain't nothing wrong with you. You're, just, you're struggling with some mental health issues. You're, you're, your body's responding to a lot of your thoughts. A lot of times anxiety can even be coupled with fear. And, and the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, it says fear is the emotional response to real or a perceived threat. Whereas anxiety is the anticipation of a future threat. Did y'all know, and I forgot it was Stan, uh, if it was Stanford or, or University of Connecticut that did a study. Did y'all know that 90% of the things we worry about don't even come true? When I found that out, I'm like, golly, I'm wasting so much time dreaming about stuff that's not gonna happen. My ongoing working definition of anxiety, which will be probably in a future book of mine talking about anxiety, is this right here. It's anxiety is the anticipation of a worst case scenario accompanied with overwhelming heartache. Is that not correct for you? Anxiety is anticipating the worst case scenario accompanied with overwhelming heartache. That I can get to the place where I can be an utter pessimist and wondering this negative outcome is going to happen. And I'm like, if 90% of the time the stuff that I worry about is not going to happen, why do I do it? Well, here's the reality. There's chemical anxiety. I believe I have that because how in the world can I be on top of the world one moment and then the very next moment feel like I'm just drowning? Some of it is circumstantial. Some of it is trauma. Some of it is the things that we think about that happened in our past. Some of the, I know some people ask me like, uh, Griff, you seem to move a lot and tug on your shirt and do all this stuff like that when you're preaching. And I'm like, yeah, a lot of that stemmed from when I was younger, since my parents divorced, since my anxiety came. And at the same time, I'm like, dude, I don't get nervous to speak in front of people. I feel like I'm home. One of the things that sometimes I will know is if I do get nervous in a conversation or somewhere else, I'll start moving a little more. I don't know why, but I do know, I do know that I didn't ask for it. And every day I ask God to take it away, but I anticipate the worst case. It's almost like Max Lucado says this. It's like a meteor shower of what ifs. My friend Stuart likes to say this. Anxiety is like conducting conspiracy theories against yourself. You start creating all these false scenarios against yourself. 
And again, I hate it. I hate it. My mind's just all over the place. I start trying to control too much. Even, I want you to hear this, the, the Greek word for worry is um, merimno and stems from the word merizo. And really it means, it, the verb is divide and the noun is mind. In other words, to be anxious is, is to divide the mind. That's why, I just wanna, that's why I'm multitasking. I don't care who you are. It's a myth. Like I, for me, literally I can be like, okay, I got to control this. I got this going on. And then I also got to figure out what this is going on. And then literally 10 to 15 things come at me at once. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what? Like, okay, I need to control that. And then I've lost focus on that. And then I need to control that. And all of a sudden it just feels like a bunch of tennis balls are hitting me in the face. And I'm just like, what in the world? Like I can't get a, I can't even master that. And I just get to this place where is my mind just that divided? Like, am I, am I, am I so worried about controlling the future that I lose my present peace? That's what it is. I'm projecting into the future and it's destroying my current reality. I'm trying to control something that I can't. But I also know that a lot of times the question is, hey, Griff, isn't anxiety and worry, isn't it a sin? Well, in the context of how Jesus said it, when he says, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or wear. Yeah, sometimes I do feel like when I worry and I try to control an outcome and I don't trust God, yeah, it can be, but I don't necessarily think experiencing anxiety is a sin. Here's what I would say. Experiencing an anxiety is not a sin. It's a signal. It's an alert system. Did y'all know there's actually good anxiety that God has placed within us? Like for me, like y'all, like for me being able to do what I do and love to do, man, I, I treat every message. I don't care if it's the students. I don't care if it's the kids. I don't care if it's to y'all. When I travel, I treat every message like I'm about to go and play some basketball. Like I get myself in the zone. Like it's a good anxiety. It's a good, okay, I'm about to bring the gospel to about six or seven generations. I've got to get myself focused. I've got to get prayed up. So there's actually a good anxiety, even that alerts you that you've got to do something. The bad anxiety is once again, is when you're trying to control, when your mind is divided. But it's not a sin to experience brokenness in your mind. It's not a sin to to get help for the things that are helping your mental health. Like, like for me, I think sometimes it's like, well, Griff, why don't you just have faith? Why do you have to take that pill? And look, that's a fair question, but let me ask you this. The next time you go to surgery, if you gotta have surgery, why don't you not take anesthesia, just have faith? <laughs> next time you got a migraine, just pray about it. And you're like, well, that's not the same thing. You know, my response is, you're right. Mental health is way more important. And so I, I've had pushback. I've almost not been hired before in places because I'm too transparent and authentic about my anxiety. Well, then I'm not your guy. It's not a sin. It's a signal. It also is what Craig Rochelle says. It's almost like an alert that it's, it's time to get with God. It's time to do something about it. So I want to go this morning is I really want to give you some tools and some handles on how you can fight well. And I want to give you a precursor from this week and even into next week as we talk about depression is the reality of this is that none of these handles and none of these tools are going to be a quick fix. None of them. But they are going to help you fight. And it's worth the fight. This life is a beautiful life. It's hard. Uh, and I have learned that adversity is a certainty. And if you struggle with anxiety in this room, whether it is circumstantial, whether it is chemistry, whether it is or chemical, whether it is something that has to do with comparison, wouldn't you rather have the tools to fight than just to give up? Philippians chapter four, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, it'll be on the screen. But Philippians chapter four will be in verses four through nine. These verses have become really my life verse. The, the, the counselor I saw in 2015 really helped me filter my anxiety through the lens of this text. And here's what's incredible about this text. The apostle Paul, he planted the church of Philippi um, and the apostle Paul writing to the church of Philippi, he's in a, uh, he, it's some debate whether he's in a Roman prison or a prison in Ephesus, but Paul is in a hole in the ground. Paul is in prison praising God while being chained to a new guard every four to six hours who don't like him. They're not playing cards down there. So essentially uh, awaiting potential immediate death. And he writes this letter and says some things and I'm like, bro, I I want to say, like, I'd rather you just say, this is, this is hell. This is hard. I don't want to do it. But he says this. Paul says, rejoice. 
Paul, are you a little tone deaf, homie? Rejoice in the Lord. Bro, you're, you're in a prison. You ain't getting out possibly. Like, are you kidding? Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Like, rejoice in the beauty of Jesus. Rejoice in the identity that God gives you. Rejoice in the love that God has lavished on you. And he's saying those things while he's in a prison. I ain't gonna lie. I can trust somebody with that kind of street cred. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. Sometimes my immediate response to anxiety is not graciousness or talking about what I'm thankful for. It's just being angry. It's just being frustrated. And he says, let it be known. He says, the Lord is near. And then he says, don't worry about anything. Some translations say, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And he says this, he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, he says, dwell on these things. And he says, do what you've learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. A man in prison is choosing to praise God. God has put him in jail so jail could get Jesus. Paul understands that in his circumstances, worry is not going to solve a thing. Letting myself dwell on what ifs that 90% of the time don't come true will not do a thing so he chooses to praise in prison. And I can't comprehend that sometimes, church. But I will say this. Later on in this text when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, I want you to know, within those texts, he says, I have learned to be content. Otherwise, what what he's also saying is, Paul didn't become a Christian and then all of a sudden become content. We've got to adjust our standards because a lot of times as followers of Jesus, like, hey, if you give your life to Jesus, all of a sudden, your sin's going to go away, your struggle's going to go away, you're going to be this this joyful follower of Jesus, you're going to be content. By the way, it never happens like that. It's a process. Growing in Jesus is a lifelong process and anxiety don't let up. You're gonna follow Jesus, but not without a fight. And sometimes anxiety's that fight, isn't it? The constant meteor shower of what ifs. Overwhelming heartache, conducting conspiracy theories against myself. How in the world do I respond when panic attacks? And church, hear this. I'm gonna give you these handles, but I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it out. These are not ironclad, like, hey, if you do these things, then step one, step two, three, but I will will say this. I do believe Paul says there's a prerequisite to peace because a lot of times there's some people in here, you just wanna tell people who have anxiety to get over it, and I want you to hear this, that's not helpful. You just wanna say, have joy, have more faith. I just want you to know when somebody's going through it, I want you to know you are doing more hurt than good, and even if you think, I'm just telling them the truth, all right, well, your truth hurts, and it's not good. It's not grace, but also for my people that struggle with anxiety, whether it's chemical, whether it's a, a, um, a circumstantial, I want you to hear this. We still have work to do. You can't lean on a shovel and expect God to dig the hole. For me, I'm up here telling y'all, I, it's a fight every single day, but I've got to fight and I've got to have the power of Jesus to help me or I'm going to go crazy. So how do we respond Y'all like, you sound like Jack from The Shining. Look, no, 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 I'm not crazy. I just don't want to get there. How can we respond when panic attacks us? Well, I want to give y'all some tools and really it's from the text. Paul says, hey, don't worry about anything. Thanks, Paul. But then he says, and everything through, (laughs) like I'm talking to the greatest missionary of all time, insulting him. Anyway. He says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Church, I know, and if you're watching online or you're in this room and you feel like, okay, great, we got a pastor on stage that's saying, hey, here's how you handle anxiety, just pray. And we're gonna look at Paul's letter and be like, seriously, that's the answer? Can I ask you a question? How's your current system working for you? 
what are you doing that is setting you up to cope with it? Because I ain't gonna lie, without the first one, I, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could last. Seriously, don't, don't insult what Paul is telling you the prerequisite to peace is if, if your own system's not working for you. Here's what he's saying. We need to fight constant worry with persistent prayer. Don't just pray, but don't do less. I find myself a lot of times trying to control outcomes. You can ask my amazing wife how much I get so frustrated that if we wake up and one of my boys has fever, I'm like, great, now I get to stay home all day and get nothing done. God, you're a jerk, dad. Why aren't you worried about your kid's health? You're worried about what you're not gonna get done. That's my anxiety. Like, what am I not gonna get done? What am I gonna, like seriously, in, in those moments, I need to stop being persistent in my pessimism and worry. I need to fight it with prayer. Jesus, even in Matthew chapter six, he says, do not worry about anything, what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna wear. Uh, I clothe the lilies of the field. I, clothe the, I give the birds food. What makes you think I'm not gonna take care of you? And you ask this incredible question. He says this, can any of you add one moment to your lifespan by worrying? Church, lean in. Worry, worry has never gotten parents back together. Worry has never cured cancer. Worry has never gotten your kid to college. Worry has never made you turn over or get a profit in business. Worry has never solved anything. Your job is not to worry. And when I'm anxious and I feel like it's gonna help, it never does. It's a waste of time. I have discovered I spent so much time worrying. And I remember a question one time was like, I think this, I forgot exactly who said this, but they were like, hey, can you imagine if you match the hours of worry with the hours of prayer? Like if I, if I worry like on average three hours a day, can you imagine if I pray for three hours a day against that worry? It's even scientific, it's even psychological. Dr. Carolina Leaf, she says this, that it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Prayer is not just for you to get blessed and get gifts from God. Prayer, prayer can also alter your brain. It can shift your mind to better things. So when you're constantly worrying, fight it with persistent prayer. He says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer, talking to the Lord through petition, presenting your requests to the king, thanksgiving, having gratitude in those prayers. And then he says, and then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know how you've ever heard that phrase, hey, I'm wor you're worrying yourself to death. Let me give you some encouragement. Don't worry yourself to death. Pray yourself to peace. Don't worry yourself to death. Pray yourself to peace. And it, while you're praying, your mind goes back to worrying. Keep praying. Keep fighting. It's worth the fight. He says, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will, it's a promise, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And here's number two. We need to learn to trust God's peace to overcome us when we feel overwhelmed by uncertainty. My twin boys have thrown certainty out of the window. A lot of stuff in life as a pastor, as a leader, as a husband, a lot of stuff gets thrown out the window and I hate it. But there's also been moments where when you actually sit in the peace of God that's always available, when you finally let it to overwhelm you, you can experience a moment of peace where you're just like, I have no idea how this happened, but God, give me your peace, download it into my brain, uh, men, or, or encourage my heart, speak to my soul, and you're just like, I don't know how, but his peace is there. And the reason it says it surpasses all understanding, because especially in America, in our microwave culture, we want a quick fix, sometimes peace happens in a way that you can't explain. When I can just breathe for a moment and just pray and seek the Father, it says, then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We've got to learn how to trust his peace to overcome us when we're overwhelmed with uncertainty. Because there's a whole lot of uncertainty in this world. And even the pandemic magnified that. That stuff is going to shut down. Things are going to happen. Will I trust God's peace in the process? 
And then he says this. Scripture's so good. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard, everyone say guard, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And here's why I love that text, because here's the deal. If peace is Jesus guarding our minds and our hearts, for those of you who struggle with anxiety, for those of you who struggle with mental health, I wanna encourage you. Man, don't give up. In fact, I would say don't give up. I would say this, give it over before you give up. Give it, give it over to God. Make sure that you're at least giving it to the author and perfecter of your faith. Make sure you're at least taking it to him before you ever say, I'm out, I'm done with this Christianity stuff, I've prayed so much, I wanna fix. Sometimes I'm telling y'all it's not gonna be fixed. I've been asking God to take away my anxiety for 12 years. It hasn't happened. It's a thorn in my flesh just like Paul. I was talking to my dude Brett Lofton earlier and it was like, bro, whether it happens or where it doesn't, whether there's healing or not, whether the anxiety goes away or not, we're gonna keep moving. Well, you gotta give it over before you give up. And he, even the apostle Peter says this, which is an incredible text. He says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. We got a mighty hand of God, y'all. Our God's not weak. So that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. That word casting literally means you throw it on to God. There was a practice I used to do a few years ago and I need to get back to it because I feel like it helped for a season. There was a time where I had a notebook by my, my bed and I would write down five or six things I was worried about. I'd put my hand on the book and say, God, these are yours. Slide it away and go to sleep. That is physically and literally taking it seriously of God, I'm taking my thoughts out of my brain, putting it onto paper, and it's yours. I'm not handling it tonight. By the way, sometimes when I worry at nighttime, I forget that I have a God that doesn't need to sleep. And I have a God that runs the world even when I'm not up. And I've gotta give it over before I give it up. Some of you need to go to journal. Some of you need to write things down so that you're not dwelling on it. Y'all, journaling has helped me in so many ways give it over before I ever think about giving it up. And then he gets down to this incredible verse of finally, brothers and sisters, he gives us a filter on how to navigate our thoughts. He says this, finally, brothers and sisters, he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, Dwell on these things. Craig Rochelle says your life's always gonna go in the direction of your strongest thoughts. What we think about, we care about, and what we care about, we chase. And a lot of us, did you know that 80% of our thoughts are negative? Chasing negative thoughts all day. You know what we need to do? We need to release toxic thoughts and replace them with the truths of God. We need to release the toxicity in our lives of the negativity in our brains because I know that I can resort to being an absolute pessimist when things aren't going my way. But when I release the toxic thoughts to God and I receive the truths of God and I replace them with the truths of God, it changes everything. Like some of you in this room right now, maybe, maybe you're struggling, like you're like, I don't know if my boss likes me or not. Well, really, what is, your, what is the fact? I have no idea. I just assume. Well, is it honorable for you to judge him like that? Hey, I, I don't think I'm worthy. I don't think I was ever worthy. Well, what's the truth? You were made in God's image, and if you meant the cross to Jesus, are you sure? That's not true. Are the things you're looking at, because sometimes, even though I don't believe experiencing anxiety is a sin, it can certainly lead to sin. So when you're doing things that are not pure, you need to ask yourself, is this pure? Are the thoughts that I'm thinking pure? Well, I need to filter that out. And my counselor helped me filter everything through this text. And I'm gonna be real, I'm not perfect at it by any means. I still struggle, even if I've memorized this verse, to go through the filter. But in the moment that we can release toxic thoughts and replace them with the truths of God, I guarantee you, you'll have a better time to fight and a better chance of winning more battles than you lose. Because I don't know about y'all, but when it comes to anxiety, I feel like I lose a lot of battles. I feel like it sucker punches me a lot. Explain to me how you can work out, eat healthy, do what you're called to do, have beautiful babies, have a beautiful wife, and still be at the gym doing reps and all of a sudden have a panic attack. With no pre-workout, by the way. 
They're like, y'all, you drinking all that caffeine? Nah, sometimes I don't. What, how in the world can I be driving down the road and cruising and listening to some good music? But like, it's going to be a great day. And the next second, I'm like, God, where are you? It reminds me of David in the Psalms. That dude was so schizophrenic and bipolar. <laughs> Think about it. David was like, you ascend the mountains, Lord. And in the very next text, he's like, where are you? God, you train my hands for war. You train my fingers for battle. You've deserted me. Does that not feel like what anxiety is? Toxic thoughts of what ifs? I'm there every day, man. Every day. Don't ever think you can look at me and think that guy's got it all together. I will prove you wrong 1,482 times. And I also over-exaggerate a lot. But anyway, verse five. Or verse nine, it says this. He says, do what you've learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. Church, I want you to hear this. Paul was forced into isolation because he was in prison. You know what's destroying a generation right now? Isolation. Isolation is so destructive. I don't care how introverted you are in this room. God has not given anybody the spiritual gift of isolation. God God wants you in community. God himself is a communal God. God created the church. The word ecclesia means to gather. And I think some of you in this room right now, because you're suppressing what's going on in your world and you're not talking about it, you're not being honest about it, and you're not being a part of some type of community, it's no wonder why you're losing some battles. Paul wrote to a church that he had so much affection for because of the community he was once in with them. Paul's telling him, learn, like, hear what you, like, do the things you heard from me. And he's, in, he's writing a love letter to a church while he's chained up. Why? Because he believed in the power of community. So I say, especially if you're a teenager in the room, I need you to hear this. Do not fight alone in silence. Don't do it. You're going to lose. Trying to figure it out on your own, trying to figure it out, trying to help yourself when you know that if, that if, self, if, if self is the problem, self can't be the solution. You need a savior. And every single one of us in this room right now, I want to encourage you because we, we have small groups. We, we have communities all over this church that you can pour into. You're like, what if they, what if they judge me? What if they, don't know? Then they, they can't relate? I promise you, by you opening up your wounds in a community of people who feel broken just like you, I promise you, you'll find some type of healing. We talked about it last week, but a great place to go would be Celebrate Recovery. Monday nights at 6.30 here at the Bayou Church. Where, we get, where they get into groups and they talk about their struggles and they get around tables instead of just being in rows and they are real about addiction. They're real about mental health. They're real about struggles and it's for anybody and everyone who's like, me too. Don't fight alone in silence. Don't fight alone in silence. Every single one of us in this room needs somebody in our corner to pull us out. Every single one of us needs someone to hold on to hope for us when we feel like we can't hold on to hope ourselves. And I love what Max Lucado says, because a lot of times <clears throat> we know anxiety, if we're honest, it might not go away anytime soon. There's so much going on in this world. There's so much busyness. There's so many things we got to do. There's so many people we got to take care of. And I love what Max Lucado says. He says this, even though the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, the prison of anxiety is optional. Because doesn't it feel like a prison sometimes? Doesn't it feel like you can never get out of it, that you legitimately are behind bars and it's like, dude, I will never break out of this. But I'll tell you this, as, as a man who struggles with anxiety, I'm not willing to go down without a fight. I can't. I'm not going to be a victim of my anxiety. I'm not gonna be someone who just lays down 
and lets it happen. I know that we have an enemy and his name is Satan. He hates my guts. He hates every single one of you. And he's going to want to continue to throw darts of overthinking, uncertainty, uncontrol at you. And you're going to continue to freak out. But I want to tell you this. In the book of Ecclesiastes, when he says there's a time to mourn, there's a time to fight, there's a time to, to, to grieve. You know what he never says in that list of things in Ecclesiastes chapter three? He never says there's a time to give up. Never. God wants to encourage you to fight when panic attacks. So church, I'm with you. For those of you who struggle with this, I'm here. I hurt. I absolutely hate it. How sometimes I just cannot get over what's in my mind. But fighting worry with constant worry with persistent prayer, trusting God's peace to overcome or overwhelm me when I felt or overcome me when I felt overwhelmed with uncertainty, giving it over before I give it up, uh, releasing toxic thoughts so I can replace them with God's truth and not fighting alone in silence. Listen to me. I don't always do good at those. And some of you are good at one and not the other, but I want to encourage you with these tools, with these handles, when you feel like you're suffocating, when you feel like there's no answer, I want to continue to work. Rather, if you take medicine, I also want you to know it's okay to have Jesus and a therapist too. Um, no matter if you're getting help, I always want to point you back to the reality that there is a rock, there is a refuge, and his name is Jesus. And even tomorrow, even if next week you feel like he's distant, keep running to him because he's there saying, hey, I've got got you. Don't fight alone in silence. I have you. Let me give you courage. Let me give you power. Keep coming to me. Even when it's hard. Listen, church, God can handle your frustrations and pain. Just keep bringing it to him. Keep bringing it to him. Keep bringing it to him. Don't give up. Keep fighting. You were meant the cross to Jesus Christ. That's your worth, that a man would walk down a road beaten profusely to die on a cross for you. There's your worth. And then resurrect three days later, showing that, that we can, just like he came out of the grave, we can come out of that dark cave. There's hope. At this moment, I'd love to ask for our encouragers to go ahead and come down. Um, and, and church, these encouragers who are coming down, they're gonna be in the front of the stage. And these encouragers are staff, volunteers, and uh, some counselors. And I wanna encourage you that if you come down, man, one of the things we wanna do is encourage your soul, pray for you. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with anxiety. Hey, maybe during me talking about it, maybe a panic kind of revved up in you and you wanna talk to somebody about that so we can pray for you. Uh, if not, man, we can also point you in the direction of some professional help, but no matter what, don't fight alone in silence. That's what these encouragers are for. I'll be at the front as well if you want to talk to me, if you need prayer. Um, and then I want to also encourage you. Uh, you know, we have the Celebrate Recovery desk or, or tables outside um, back through these doors to the le my left, your right or when you're going out those doors to the left. And if you want more information on what it really means to be a part of Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights at 6.30, I want to encourage you to go through those doors um, and uh, seek help. But don't fight alone in silence. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of your word, by the power of your will, by the power of your spirit, that you would, man, I, I do pray that you would release us from any chains, any prison of anxiety. But Father, in the moments we feel like we're still suffocating, in the moments we still feel like we want to give up, I pray that we would fight constant worry with persistent prayer. I pray that we would trust your peace to overcome us when we feel overwhelmed by uncertainty. God, I pray we would give it over before we give up. I pray, uh, Father, that we would release toxic thoughts and replace them with the truth of God, and I pray we would not fight alone in silence, that we would engage in the battle knowing that it's going to be a fight, but that it's okay to struggle. But I pray we struggle in the circles of community and in the mighty hand of God. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, love you, church. See you next week.